So now I just want to get into my testimony. I'm going to try to make it as brief as possible because I want to, to also open up the floor uh, for you. So early on in my life, in my childhood, I, I had a, a tender conscience, a sensitive conscience. I, I uh, remember uh, a time where I was at a camp meeting in, in Wisconsin, and my, my mom told me to come right back to the, the campsite after the meeting. And so, I, after the meeting, I started heading back to the campsite. But then people were having a water balloon fight. So, guess what? I joined them. <laughs> and I got wet, obviously. <laughs> and then I headed back to the campsite. And my mom asked me how I got, you know, because I was wet. She asked me how I got wet. So I made up this lie that, oh, I, um, someone sprayed me while I was at the drinking fountain. You know, it was, it was, it was that lie. And, and so my mom accepted this explanation. And, and she turned around, and I turned around to walk the other way. And immediately my conscience smote me. Immediately. I, I, and I just, I remember I burst out in tears, and I confessed that, you know, I had taken part in this water balloon fight. I, I couldn't for a moment live with the guilty conscience. It just, and uh, later on, um, my brothers and, and my uncle, we, we, had, we were at my grandparents' place, and they, they had this, this uh, apartment that they would rent out, but no one was in there at that time. And so we had went down there, and we were watching movies which we were not supposed to be doing. And so when, when, we, when we got up, you know, up to, up, it was an upstairs uh, apartment, my, my grandparents' apartment. So when we got up to the upstairs apartment, uh, uh, my parents asked, you know, what were we doing? You know, where were we? What were we doing? And, and uh, there was some excuse or some, you know, some lie that was made. And my conscience again smote me, and I, I couldn't, I could not live with that guilty conscience. And, and me, you know, I confess, I, I, you know, even though we, we all were saying one thing, I just, I couldn't live with that guilty conscience, and I confessed. I said, uh, you know, that we were, we were down there watching movies, you know, I just, so as a child, I had this sensitive conscience that, that, uh, but having a sensitive conscience doesn't work too well. If you want to hang out with your peers and do things that you're not supposed to. <laughs> and I realize that, and people don't want to hang out with you if you're tattling. <laughs> I mean, on yourself even, but you know, it's a, you're, you're telling the truth. You know, people don't want to hang out with you. And so I, I realized that. And in my heart, as a young person, I was maybe nine years old, I determined that I, I, it's, 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 it was this unconscious or subconscious pact I made with God, this agreement. And basically this agreement, and again, it was subconscious. It wasn't like I actually made this agreement with God, but it was, God, I'm going to do my own thing right now. I'm going to do my own thing right now. And then when I get older, I'll settle down, get married, have a family, and then I'll serve you. Then I'll come to you. So, so I made this agreement in my heart. And from that time, and again, I don't know exactly what day that was or whatever. It wasn't an actual, like, this verbal agreement, but it was more of a, this is, this, this, this is how, how I was feeling or whatever. But um, my conscience no longer bothered me. I could lie. I could do anything without a single twinge of guilt. And if we go to Romans, it describes my condition. Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, verse 28. The Bible says, And even... As they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, and that was my condition. I didn't want to think about God because when I thought about God, I couldn't do the things I wanted to do. 
without feeling guilty. And so, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate, reprobate mind. And if you look in the marginal, if you have this in your Bible, the Bible says, a mind void of judgment. A mind void of judgment. So God gave them over to a mind void of judgment, discernment, a lack of discernment, to do those things which are not convenient. And that was my condition for about 10 years, where my conscience was silenced, just totally silent. I, I never felt guilty, um, except for one point, at one point. And, it was, and as I think about this, it was actually about the halfway point, about five years into that 10-year that period. I was at the academy, Wisconsin Academy, and I ended up getting really heavily into pornography. And I, I had gotten a bunch of these, these images, these files on my computer, and I think I had, I don't know, 600 megabytes or gigabytes, but back then that was a huge amount of, of, of data. Uh, and, you know, I'd gotten it, you know, from different friends or whatever and had this all downloaded onto my computer. And then there was a week of prayer, and they were talking about purity. And all of a sudden, that conscience that had been dead for five years just awoke. And I was squirming in my seat. I knew I was in sin. I knew I was guilty before God. And I remember after that meeting, I walked into my room. I went to the computer. I clicked on that folder and I clicked delete. I wish that was the happy ending. At that point, though, my friends had come into the room and they saw what I was doing. And they said, what are you doing? And so I made it into a joke that, oh, ha ha, you know, because of the meetings, deleting this. And then I went to the recycle bin and restored it. And my conscience was again dead for five more years. So this was in... Uh, 2021, no, I'm sorry, 2001, 2001, <laughs> 2001, okay, 2001, um, I was going to Andrews, Andrews University at this time, <clears throat> and at this point, um, I was uh, into smoking marijuana, and we, I was, we went out with some friends, and we were smoking marijuana. And these, these two friends, they were actually, they were twins. They liked to really talk about, you know, Bible prophecy and things like that, you know. And, and, I, and I remember as, as we were sitting there smoking marijuana, we were sitting, it was, it was nighttime in the dark uh, at a kind of a park boat landing area, looking up into the heavens. And one of them said something about Jesus coming, you know, Jesus' second coming. And uh, I remember, I remember all of a sudden, all of those childhood feelings, those good feelings, those desires for heaven just welled up in me. And it was this sense of, you know, that's where I want to be. I, you know, and so anyhow, that, that day passes. I, it might have been a month later. Um, I just, it was, I had just come, it was a Sabbath day. I had just come back from my room, uh, from smoking marijuana with some friends and came back to my dorm room. And my roommate was gone that weekend, so I was alone. And when I came back into that dorm room, as I walked into the room, this thought came to me, and, and I know it was from the Lord, because it wasn't my thought. I said, you know, it's the Sabbath, I should read my Bible. <laughs> I had never in my life, and here I was 19 years old, I had never in my life opened up the Bible to read it for myself, outside of maybe an assignment for class. 
I never open up the Bible to read it for myself. So where this thought came from, <laughs> it's, it's from the Lord. You, and, I, and those were the, the, immediately, it was, you know, it's the Sabbath. I should read my Bible. Where that came from, you know, it's, <laughs> it did not come from me. And so I remember, I remember this perfectly. Just, I sat down on the floor with my Bible. I had my back against uh, these built-in desks, uh, you know, on the wall. Put my back, you know, leaned up against there. I opened my Bible. And I opened up to the story of, of the children of Israel crossing the Red Sea. And I'm reading the story how God parts the waters, how the children of Israel make it across. And then the Pharaoh's army comes after them. They go through the Red Sea after them. And then I read, it says, And the Lord removed the wheels of their chariot so that they drove them heavily. And I'm like, what? God took the wheels off the chariots? I don't remember that part of the story. I've heard these stories my entire life. You know, I grew up in an Adventist home. I've never heard that part of the story. I wonder what else they haven't told me. <laughs> and that was the thought that came to me. I was like, wow, I was amazed. I mean, I was like, what else? Did they think I wouldn't believe that part? I, I don't know. It's just, <laughs> I had never heard that part of the story. And it, again, it awoke in this desire to know more of God's word. Like, what don't I know? <laughs> you know? Is there more? But even yet, the Lord, the Lord um, was working on me. I want to read a quote here from Steps to Christ. And it's interesting because this chapter is called the, the Test of Discipleship. She starts the chapter with 2 Corinthians 5.17. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. She says a person may not be able to tell the exact time or place or trace all the chain of circumstances in the process of conversion. But this does not prove him to be unconverted. <coughs> Christ said to Nicodemus, The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So everyone that is born of the Spirit, John 3, 8, like the wind which is invisible, yet the effects of which are plainly seen and felt is the Spirit of God, in its work upon the human heart. That regenerating power which no human eye can see begets a new life in the soul. It creates a new being in the image of God. While the work of the Spirit is silent and imperceptible, its effects are manifest. If the heart has been renewed by the Spirit of God, the life will bear witness to the fact. While we cannot do anything to change our hearts or to bring ourselves into harmony with God, well, we must not trust at all to ourselves or our good works. Our lives will reveal whether the grace of God is dwelling in us. A change will be seen in the character, the habits, the pursuits. The contrast will be clear and decided between what they have been and what they are. The character is not revealed by the occasional good deeds and occasional misdeeds, but by the tendency of the habitual words and acts. God's Spirit was at work with me at that point when I didn't even know it. He was working in me, moving me toward a direction. And remember we talked about the sanctuary and, and moving that God is moving his people toward a direction. So individually, God was working on me, moving me toward a direction. So this was, and I remember the date exactly. It was 420. Uh, it's, it's, it's significant uh, with the uh, you know, marijuana smoking community. This idea, hey, let's meet at 420 um, to go, go smoke. So April 20 is, is like the international pot smoking day. That's why I remember the date. So I was, I was driving home from, from Andrews University, uh, you know, from Michigan to Wisconsin, and my roommate was with me, and I was going to be dropping my roommate off to, to, to stay with his girlfriend who was, who was studying at a, uh, a public college in Appleton, Wisconsin. And so as I'm driving there, the, the weather, it had rained just lightly, just lightly for the roads to be a little slick. And so when I took the exit to the college uh, that, that I was going to be dropping my friend off, 
I was going too fast. So the car, I wasn't, with the roads being a little slick, the car slid and the front left tire slammed into the curb and it broke the, the A-arm. So the tire is kind of going crooked now. So now I can't go home. Um, so we get a tow truck to pull it uh, to the, the parking lot of the college there. And I was gonna be spending the night with, with my friend and his, his girlfriend in their room. And of course it's 420, so a bunch of people come into the room there and, and we're all smoking marijuana. <clears throat> and then they get a cot, a cot for me to, to lay out there. And, you know, I, and, and they went to sleep and I'm laying there on the cot. And suddenly after 10 years, my conscience awakens. And as I was telling Brother David, you know how, how if, if you have like local anesthesia, when it wears off, the pain is so intense, more intense than, than the pain you would have felt maybe during. It's just that you feel all of that pain all at once. Mm -hmm. That night, it was as though all the guilt that I should have felt for those 10 years, I felt that night. Mm. And I felt as though I was standing before the bar of God, condemned, and all I saw in front of me was hell, that I was lost eternally, if I continued this direction. But I didn't want to change. I did not want to change. You know, some people, <clears throat> when they share a testimony, they have this, this bottom of the burial experience, like they're at the very lowest point of their life, and they turn to God. For me, I was enjoying life. I was, things were going well. I was, I was, I had found this drug that I really loved, you know, and, and I was just really enjoying it. I, I, it wasn't, I wasn't having any negative experience. I was just loving life, doing my own thing. <clears throat> I did not want to change. <clears throat> and I remember thinking in my heart, God, you're not keeping your end of the deal. I was supposed to do my own thing until I get older. I'm only 19, you know. <clears throat> until I get older, and then I'm going to serve you. You're not keeping your end of the deal. You're not supposed to be coming back here and, and guilting me, get, you know, entering my thoughts. You know, I, I was trying to forget you for this time. <clears throat> and I tossed, and I turned, and I tossed, and I turned, and I could not sleep, and eventually... It, I don't know how long it was, eventually I fell asleep. Woke up the next morning, and the first thing they do, yes, they light up. They, they, grab a, they have a joint, they grab a joint, and they light up. And I knew, I knew what I had seen before me. If I take that, I'm guilty. I'm guilty. I, I'm, a, I'm a condemned man. My, my future is eternal damnation. But you know, the fear of man, as I was saying, the fear of man was greater than the fear of God. If you can believe that, having the vision of eternal damnation before you, I feared man more. And I was like, what would they think if I said no? Would I, what, how would I tell them, that I'm under conviction? <clears throat> so I took it and I smoked it, but I felt awful. I felt condemned. <laughs> <clears throat> about, it was about 20 days later, school had finished for that semester, and before I went home, I had spent the day with, with this, this girl that I had liked. And <clears throat> many years back, um, I had gone on a trip with some friends, and we were drinking and doing, you know, smoking. I think it was more of smoking uh, cigarettes or something. And, <clears throat> maybe drinking, but anyhow, this friend after that trip asked me, because she knew they, they did those things, she asked me if I was doing that. And I acknowledged, yes, I was doing that. And she said, promise me that if you ever do that again, that you tell me. And, you know, I, I always keep a promise <laughs> for some reason, you know. Uh, and so, so here it was, <clears throat> oh yeah, I should, I should qualify that. I would keep a promise, but I, I remember thinking, well, I never told her when I would tell her. <laughs> so, 
So anyhow, this was several years after that. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> the semester had ended, and I had spent the day with her. And again, you know, I, I'd liked her. And, and I was thinking, what would she think now if she knew the things I was doing now? You know, if, if she had me promised to tell her, you know, for smoking cigarettes, what if, what if, what if she knew the things I was doing now? And um, my friend had, my roommate, had given me uh, three cigarettes to smoke on the way home. So after I spent that, that day with, with her and her family, I get in my car and I, I drive home. And I have those three cigarettes sitting there you know, on the, on the count, center console. And all of a sudden, the thought comes to me, you should throw those out the window. And I remember fighting and struggling with the Lord because I did not want to change. I did not want to enter into the Christian life. I knew what it meant, and I didn't want it because it meant not having fun, <laughs> not being able to do all these things that I'm really enjoying doing right now. You know, because, you know, the way my, my parents raised me, it was, it wasn't with a, a half-hearted Christianity. It was with a, a, uh, a Christianity that, that when you serve the Lord, you give yourself to the Lord reserve, unreservedly, every area of your life, your diet, your music, movies, whatever it is, uh, your, your lifestyle is, is different because you're a Christian. So I knew what it meant to be a Christian. That's how I've been raised. And I didn't want that. I didn't want that because I knew I'd have to give up all these things. And so I struggled and I just grabbed it and smoked it, smoked that cigarette. But you know, it wasn't enjoyable. I felt guilty the whole time I was doing it. And the thought came to me after I finished that one, throw those other two out the window. And I drove, it was a five hour drive, five and a half hour drive, so I drove. It took me another hour or two as I'm struggling, this, this whole time the Lord is saying, throw them out the window. And I'm saying, no. Throw them out the window. No. I don't want to. No, I do not want to. No. I grabbed the second one and I smoked it. And again, guilt. Guilt is what I felt. And I made it all the way home with that last cigarette sitting there. And it wasn't all the way. It was, it was near home. I was about a mile or two from home. Uh, we live, lived close to the Green Bay, the actual bay of Green Bay, um, only a couple miles from there. And so I remember driving the car and parking by this, this little area where you can just uh, you know, park the car and, and maybe it was a boat launch or something and, and just see, see the bay. It's, it's probably 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock. I don't know how late it was, maybe midnight. And I had that last cigarette. I mean, I had it in my hand and I said, okay, Lord, I'm going to smoke to my last cigarette. This is going to be my last one. And so I took that cigarette, and I stood there by the water, and I started smoking it, and I couldn't finish it. The condemnation was so great, so, so just this guilt and condemnation, condemn, condemnation upon me. I only smoked it halfway, and I, and I tossed it. I remember going into my car, grabbing that, the Bible from the car. I remember opening it to, to some verse, you know, randomly opening it to a verse. And I remember reading that verse. And whatever it said, I don't remember. I wish I could remember what the verse said. But whatever it said, it made me feel condemned. <laughs> Even more condemned. It, whatever that verse was, it was... It, I just felt condemned. And so what I remember is just closing the Bible, getting into the car, going home, and going to bed. Now this is the part of this story that, that doesn't make sense to me. But it shows the goodness of God because I woke up the next morning 
a new person. I woke up in the morning changed with new desires, new thoughts, with no desire to do evil, only to serve God with all my heart. The first thing I did when I woke up was got on my knees and pray. And I had perfect peace with the Lord. All that condemnation that I experienced was gone. It, it wasn't anything I did because I woke up that way. The prior night, I didn't want to change. There was no indication that I wanted to change. So God did something for me that I wasn't willing to do for myself. My, my thoughts, my, my purposes, my desires were totally sold out to Christ. And I don't get that. It, it does not make sense to me. It doesn't make sense to me at all. I don't, I don't deserve it. When I was 19 years old. And there's another part to this testimony. I, you know, I, I wish it ended there on the happy note, but, but there's another part which even shows more of the glory of God, but that's going to be for another time. And it's not to say that I have not backslidden during this, this past, uh, I guess it's been 24 years, roughly. But my heart has always been turned toward the Lord. Amen. That I've never, the desire to enter back into Satan's kingdom, though the temptations have been there, God has always put that in my heart. And, and, and again, I, I, I can't explain it. There was, it, it's like what, what we read of the spirit of prophecy. The spirit of God was working in me. The, that wind was blowing. I didn't make this conscience decision to follow the Lord. He did it for me. And I, and I don't get it. I don't get it. But I, I just want to open this floor now for, for you to, to share your testimony of how the Lord has been good to you. Uh, something perhaps maybe you heard this weekend. Something that, that the Lord has has. has convicted you upon or, or inspired you with or even to uh, offer you know, uh, an offering of thanksgiving or, or you know, whatever it may be to, for the Lord. So I want to open the floor now to, to allow you to share.